When you have your girls, you're never alone. You get together for coffee, maybe to work out, or just to laugh. We created Hey Girl, just for you. Can't wait for you to join us. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm your girl, Kim with an E, and this is Hey Girl, episode 69. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to let you know that Hey Girl is a safe space where you can share your experiences and be affirmed. Let's face it, life can be complex and sometimes overwhelming. That's why we believe in the power of conversation, because knowing we're not alone is what helps us get through. And you are not alone today, so come on in, join the party. We're all here. Tell me you're here as well. Say hello in the comments. And how are you now that we are going back? I don't know how many of you have already gone back. If not this week, probably next week, or certainly the week after that, we are going back to school. So tell me how has that been this past week for me was the go back week. And what does that even mean? Because I don't even have babies anymore. I have one in college and one in high school. This should not be this hard, but it still is. And maybe it's harder because we're really going back, right? We're going back to in-person school. We're going back to in-person church. It's just everything is going back. And yet it's not really the same as it was before. Um, so. Just getting into the rhythm of life again has been something. I don't know how it's been for you, but this week was killer. <laughs> so tell me, how has going back been for you? Have your children started going back to school this week? Do they start going back next week? And what is that going to look like for you? That's the question. I don't know. I'm exhausted, honestly. Um, I think not having to get dressed and put on heels and real clothes for a year and a half kind of puts you in this mode of being casual and laid back. And it, it for a year and a half, that just makes it even more hard to, uh, to kind of get buttoned up and, and out the door. So yeah, there's a lot of changes though. There's a lot going on lot that's different, even though we're trying to, quote unquote, go back. It's not the same as it was. There's this new normal that we also have to get through. And it can be challenging. I don't know how many of you joined us last week. We had my friend Jana Peterson here, and she was talking about her mental health advocacy organization. Great organization. If you or someone you know needs some help, I mean, these are, these are tough times. If you have children who need help, they may need to see someone. And I know a lot of times the first thing we think is I can't afford therapy, or maybe we're embarrassed to admit we need it. But all of us need that check in from time to time, we need that extra support. And what's so great about Jana's organization is that she is providing mental health um, resources and mental health appointments, even for those who don't have insurance, even for those who can't afford it. So you definitely want to check out 57 North Hampton. She gave us some, um, some great resources as well. And she was kind enough to share them with us so that we can share them with you. You can go right here on this same Facebook page where you are. Go into the photos folder and you'll see the handout that she has for us that she gave us last week, particularly for your children. You know, a lot of times we think about therapy for adults. But we don't, don't remember that. Kids need that as well. And so the, the what to do with worry handouts that are particularly designed for children will be really useful if, for those of you out there who have kids that are trying to cope with all of the changes that have been happening lately and maybe are a little anxious about going back to school and having to make friends all over again. I know that can really be hard. So definitely check out those handouts. Um, they're, they're kid friendly and very useful and, and all the, really a lot of the same information that is given to us as adults, but in a, in a kid friendly way. And speaking of coping information for adults, I want to remind you about the coping kit that we put together last year. Thanks to, uh, therapy for black girls, wonderful resource as well. We have that here on Facebook in that same folder. For you moms who need to get your coping kit together, 
to handle all the stresses as well. And then, of course, you know, you can find those same resources at, on my website, justkim.net. And there's additional things there as well for you moms out there that need some of that extra support. So, guys, if you're here, come on in. Tell me you're here. Say hello in the comments. And be sure to like and share this live. If you're watching later in the replay, you can also check out earlier episodes right here on our Facebook page, or you can also go to our YouTube channel to see all the past episodes. So I'm really excited to introduce you to my guest for today. Considering that our theme is going back, what better person to invite to join us today than our my good friend Ebony Holland, who is the superstar teacher. So she's going to talk to us today about this whole going back to school situation that we're in now, and and how she is doing it on her end. So moms and who are out there who've been doing homeschool, I'm sure you appreciate your teachers so much more now after experiencing that. So. Ebony Holland is known most notably in the gospel industry as one third of the Grammy nominated award winning vocal trio Virtue. And while music is still her passion and career, she is duly faceted in her passion for teaching young minds. Ebony is a superstar teacher who goes from the stage to the classroom, finding creative and engaging ways to stimulate her students. She has been an educator for over 20 years and holds a bachelor's degree from Oakwood University and a master's degree in education administration from the University of Phoenix. When Ebony is not in the classroom or on the road, you can find her at home with her husband, Skip, of 19 years, her teenage son, Stinger, and their miniature schnauzer, Astro. I love that. Welcome, Ebony Holland, to Hey Girl. Oh, I love the names. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> so awesome to have you as well. And so excited for this conversation. You know, we have known each other for a long time. A long time. We can That's, say 30 years. <laughs> gosh, I can't even believe it. You're old enough 1991. <laughs> It's just crazy. Yeah. And I totally had a deja vu moment this week because I had to move my daughter into Wade Hall. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I don't think I have literally walked those halls. I've, I've kind of stepped in the lobby from time to time, but not like gone down the hallway into the room. Right. I was like, oh, is this happening? I remember well, being I, there. I can't, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine it. I cannot imagine it. I have next year. Stinger will be next year. So I am Get ready. I'm crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the thing that will be different for you is he's a he's a boy. So you'll be you'll be moving him. But to walk into Wade Hall where we used to live yes. and settle my daughter into her room, that was crazy. That was crazy. But but just the fact that we're taking our kids back to the school. <laughs> even know what to do with that. Oh, hey, Heather. <laughs> Chef Mommy's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this week has been, uh, there's been a lot of memories that have been stirred up uh, walking back on campus. And it's been such an interesting experience for my daughter because this is her second year, but it feels like her first year because last year was just so different. It was, she didn't really get to have that experience of the wow. first year. And so many kids experienced yeah. that, that, that whole year kind of just taken away. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, this fall is kind of just a, 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 a new thing for, for so many people in so many ways because of just the last year and a half, everything kind of slowing down. And yeah, it's going to just be interesting to see how this yeah. goes. <laughs> yeah, but I'm excited that they get to go back because I felt so bad last year when they graduated, all the seniors had to go to school yeah. online for a whole year and then think they will be able to go to college and have to stay home and do college. So I'm excited for all of our friends who took their kids and their second year there this year. So I'm excited for that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am too. Um, so I want to back up though and talk about how this has been for you as a teacher this you know we just we we kind of know what it's been like for us as moms 
mm-hmm. for our own kids. We see our friends whose kids have had to deal with it. But as a teacher, how has this last year and a half been for, for you? As a teacher, it has been, it was rough because we heard that this pandemic was coming. It was spring break. We were actually doing parent-teacher conferences and we were going on spring break. So we were looking forward to the break. And so um, midway into the break, they were like, "Uh, you're not going back to school. So my break ended and we got into mode like, oh my God, what are we going to do? How are we going to work this? What is going to happen? Uh And so um, my spring break was spent planning and trying to figure out how we were going to take the kids to school online and so that was really really difficult I mean I really worked like 10 times harder last year just because it was online because it was something that we were unfamiliar with and so with that um I was tired I sat I sat at the table at the desk trying to find a spot that I would you know work from and um it was it was pretty hard. It was it was really hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It was challenging trying to keep the attention of the students online and trying to figure out who had a computer, who didn't have a computer, trying to get computers to kids who didn't have them. It was right. rough. But once you got into the swing of it, it was okay. But for the first maybe, because we only had what, from March till May, it was, mm-hmm. it was, it was rough. It was, I'm telling you, I was tired. I mean, I, it was 12 o'clock that I didn't even get up from sitting where I was sitting from six o'clock in the morning. So, Uh, but once school started again, I was, got the swing of it. I had the hang of it. And so it was fine. But in the very beginning, it was rough. rough. Well, it was, it was such a change for everyone. And there was that learning curve for Mm -hmm. teachers as well, because the technology you had to kind of figure out. Um, But it was, it was like, everybody was in survival mode for, Mm -hmm. for that. We felt like, okay, if we could just get to the end of the year, we're, you know, halfway there, this thing will go away and then the fall will go back. <laughs> Normal. Of course, that didn't happen. Yeah. But what grade are you dealing with um, in the midst of all this? What grade are you talking about? I am teaching middle school, social studies and um, Bible, sixth, seventh and eighth grade. Okay. Okay. So I know that those who taught the little, little ones really had a challenge on their hands because yeah. the and all that, but middle school is still tough. I mean, middle school is tough, period, mm-hmm. <laughs> whether you're mm-hmm. virtual or, or in person. So, and and where do you teach? I forgot to, to mention. I'm at Tacoma Academy Preparatory School in, Mar- in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Okay. And did you always know that you wanted to be a teacher? Was this something you always wanted to do? I did. I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher. I taught my teddy bears. I taught my sisters. <laughs> And I know I drove them crazy because anytime we played any games outside with our neighborhood kids, I was always in charge. I was a teacher telling them what we were going to do. Um, but my love for teaching came when I met my third grade teacher, Miss Provost, um, and she happens mm-hmm. to be in Huntsville right now. Um, not not Esther Provost, her sister Marjorie Provost. Provost. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And so. Um, she 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 was my idol. I love going to class. I love seeing the things that she would do for us each day. And I didn't want to miss a day of school because I was afraid I would miss something fun that they were going to do in class. And if she okay. left the class, she would always say, Ebony, you're in charge. Go to the board. You know, <laughs> show them how to add, do this. And I would instantly turn into her. So I was <laughs> about that and so I knew you know right that and I know for sure in third grade that I wanted to be a teacher because I wanted to be just like Miss Provost. (laughs) Oh that is so cool and the fact that you actually did become it I mean I think kids especially my girls I don't know maybe it's the the bossy girls I don't know how you were but they they played teacher all the time and they were always the teacher boss and everybody around. So I wondered how many people who are like that like my girls actually become teachers or is it just like a stage because they like bossing kids around. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I have two teachers on my hands, who knows. Um, but yet you also have this singing career. So I remember when we were at Oakwood, you guys started that group and it took off. So it's so interesting that you are a singer and a, te- a teacher. Mm-hmm. Talk about that interesting mix. Yeah, I, I just like I came, I went to Oakwood to become a teacher. And um, someone asked uh, Kareem, my sister, to get a group together to sing at AYS at a program on a Friday night. And so um, she got the group together. We sang. And um, this big record label came to the school. 
somebody said, oh, there's this group, because she was looking for a new artist to put on this new record label that was out of New York. And so she came to a couple of our rehearsals and she signed us just right away. And I was afraid, oh my goodness, I'm not gonna be able to finish college because I wanna be a teacher. And at this point, I was, I'll be the first person in my entire family to graduate from college. And that was one of my goals to finish college. And I was really nervous that that wouldn't happen because of the singing career. But because I had gracious teachers that let me take my stuff on the road. And so even when I was doing my practicum, you know, teaching and going from the stage to the classroom, I realized that they went hand in hand, that you have to be prepared for both of the things that you're doing. So on the stage, I had to be prepared, you know, with vocal lessons, uh, sound checks, rehearsals, all of those things. And then on, in the classroom, I had to make sure that I was differentiating from my students, that I had my lesson plans, that everything was in order for my students. So they went hand in hand. So I went from the stage to the classroom, from the classroom to the stage. And um, it was enjoyable. But, and because I know that God blessed me to do both of them, he wanted me to do these things. So if it wasn't for him, I would not have been able to do those because he appointed me to do those two things. So I'm great. So he, he called you and equipped you to get it done. Yes. Sounds like it was probably a lot, though. Now, have you always taught middle school or did you start off teaching other grades? No, I taught all the grades. I substituted all the grades. But the main grades that I've taught is first grade and now middle school. So I taught first grade for 10 years and I love my little first grade superstars. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I was listening to an NPR uh, story the other day and they were talking about there's a, a, t a teacher shortage really mm -hmm. across the country in particular I think we talked in particularly about Texas and they were talking about the various uh efforts they've made different districts have made to try to get good teachers try to get teachers period and even getting teachers in who maybe haven't taken the traditional route to education and so on and they were really looking at what made whether there was a difference in the preparedness of the teacher as to whether they were successful as teachers and they, they actually the, the statistics were mixed they, they weren't able to come down definitively that if you took the traditional route through college and went into teaching you did any better than those who maybe took other certification routes what have you but what they did find is that for those teachers who stayed in, to teach, in teaching longer, they typically had taken a more traditional route, but it was their, the time that they stayed in the classroom teaching that actually determined whether they had better outcomes or not. So it wasn't so much, basically it sounds like everyone started at the same starting line, but mm -hmm. it's those teachers that stayed in the game longer that, that proved to be better teachers. So the ones who did it for a little while and then quit, they never really got that good and mm -hmm. as the ones who who did it for a period of time. And so I, I know that you've been teaching for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. What would you say about your, the quality of your teaching when you started versus where you are now? Do you believe that that duration of time is what has made you a better teacher? Yeah, I believe that, you know, for me, teaching is my passion. And I, it's, it's something that I always wanted to do. And I always tell people who are interested in being a teacher that, hey, if this is something that you really, really want to do, you have to give 100% at it. And so you have a lot of teachers who, whether we, the teacher retention, the turnover is really bad because it's not something that they want to do. They, they figured this is an easy, you know, an easy career. And then once you get in it, you don't really like it. And so first of all, you got to like kids. So if you don't like kids, you can't be a teacher. <laughs> You know, but I think I want, might want to do this, but I think the longer that I have been in it, the more I, 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 I want to help other teachers, you know, find that passion and find the missing pieces that, that maybe the, when they started, they, they had a different idea and now they're in it for so long and they're just stagnant and doing the same things over and over and over and over. But I think that, um, that the longer you are in it, and if this is something that God has really chosen for you to do, you're going to stay in it. And so when you see this turnover and turnover and turnover, it's because it wasn't what they were supposed to do. And so, um, with the teachers that are, you know, cause there are a lot of like young teachers right now. And I mean, they can find a job like that. So they're hopping from job to job to find out what are, you know, some of the things that they would want to do in life. But I think that the longer you are in it, and I have, what, about 20, 20 years now. And mm -hmm. um, I think that this has been, you know, something that God has blessed me to do and to be passionate about it. And um, the longer I am in it, the more I love it. 
So. Okay. So good answer. I, I guess that's a really important point to make that teaching is not like maybe other careers that you you get in for the money. You get in right. because of the benefits. You get in because, you know, I know a lot of people want to be teachers so they get their summers off, right? So there, those are not the things that are going to really probably motivate you to continue no. in the job. Um, yeah. you, have you, have, you have to really, you have to really, really love it and make sure that, you know, the, I mean, these, the kids that we're teaching, they're our future. These kids turn out to be lawyers, doctors, other teachers, they turn out to be, you know, whatever it is that they can dream of scientists. So, you know, just to have a part in, Hey, my first grade teacher, I learned this in first grade. And just to have them say, Hey, I remember this person. It's just a blessing. And it just makes me feel so good that I know that I taught a doctor or a lawyer or, or dancer or whatever it is, or another teacher. So yeah, yeah, make sure that it's something that you love to do and that you love kids, first of all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have some people saying hi to us in the comments. Let me see if I can pull those up. I think I think I saw your mom in the comments. Oh, is she? <laughs> and hi, I think so. And let me see. I can't seem to get to. Oh, here we go. Can I get to the comments? Um, you know, sometimes I have issues seeing them. No, it's not working for me. Okay. Oh, Rebecca Trotter says, hi, ladies. So oh, yeah. proud of you, Ebony. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see the comments now. Cool. I don't know if anyone else is out there. Welcome all of you who are there. Thank you for joining us. So, you know, I, I know. Oh, hey, Sandy. <laughs> My sister-in-law. Good to see you there as well. <laughs> So, you know, I, I hear, I mean, teachers work very hard. You know, they, people don't, I think, appreciate how hard teachers work. And I know that teacher burnout is a thing. So regardless of whether you're passionate for this job or not, there has to be times when you get frustrated, where you get tired, where you get overwhelmed. So how do you, how do you handle those moments, those times? And, and what advice do you give to others who may be thinking, you know what, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I'm, I'm exhausted especially considering what this last year has been like. I'm sure teachers have been challenged in ways that they hadn't even before and, and may have been tempted to say, you know what, I'm, I'm getting out of this game. Mm -hmm. I, I just promised myself, hey, this is a time frame that I'm working with. If I'm to be at school at 7.30 in the morning, if I can do my work at school and leave it there, I'm leaving it there. I'm not going to bring it home. Like over the weekends, for sure, if you cannot you know, just focus on yourself on the weekends just, just to make sure that, you know, you're giving yourself a brain break. I always give my students brain breaks and I feel, look, I need a brain break too. So I am cutting everything off that has to do with anything that school. I'm going to get my nails done. I'm going to get my toes done. I'm going to have a nice dinner or oh, I may cook dinner. Those are the things that relax me, you know, to make sure that I'm not having, um, you know, burn, teacher burnout. And when that happens, I make sure that, um, that I'm not bringing the homework home. I'm not doing any of those things. I mean, I love my students to, to no end, but there are times when you get stressed out and you don't want to see anything that has to do with school. So you just have to leave it aside and then you pick that back up and like nothing ever happened. You know, you don't bring that stress to school. You get, you stay at home with that. But um, those are the things I do when I get stressed out. I um, and, and I try not to get stressed out um, with, with the workload, but sometimes like during the pandemic, it was very stressful and I found myself overworking and I made myself sick. I had vertigo I, because you're looking, I have wasn't used to looking at the computer like all day long. So I had to get the blue glasses. And so even, even with that, I was like in school, you don't go to the bathroom, you know, you because you don't want to leave the kids. I was find myself doing the same thing, sitting at the computer. I'm in my own house and like, oh, my goodness, I didn't even go to the bathroom all day today. I wasn't drinking water. I was not eating. I didn't do any of those things. So when I gave the, the kids a brain break during the um, during the Zoom classes, I went outside. I got some fresh air. I walked the dog. I took, you know, time. I moved away from the screen. And so. Just advice to teachers, making sure that, you know, if you feel in that way, leave your work at school, leave it in the car. And, you know, I'll bring it home anyway, and I'll just leave it in the car, you know, because <laughs> every day I say, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. But by the time I get home, I'm worn out. So um, it stays in the car. But if you have those breaks at school where you have, you know, time to plan, do it in your planning time and try to leave it at school and not bring it home. But take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I, I think that's very important. And the coping kit that we offered everyone, it, we talked we talk many times about that, taking time to take care of yourself. And, and the coping kit is a little box that you'd have somewhere where you can kind of retreat from time to time and just, just sort of feed your soul. But, you know, well, we're talking about their it. teachers. Are you there? Yeah. I think we it for a second. Okay. Uh, we're talking to teachers, right? But what about all those parents? who became teachers all of a sudden this past year, whose children came home and they were like, oh, homeschool, what? (laughs) Right. Uh, Yeah, like. In the the beginning, I, I put out a video because I knew parents were stressing out and I gave them about five tips and I can't remember the exact five tips, but it got shared everywhere. And they were like, thank you so much for these tips. And I just basically told them, look, Clear a space, you know, don't have clutter around the kids. I mean, you're a teacher now. You're not really teaching, teaching, but you're in charge of the schedule and all those things. Give them a schedule just as if they were in class. Make sure that they were, um, what did I tell them? That to make sure that, um, that they had lunch, that you gave them breaks as well. Because with mm-hmm. my school, uh, we did all the teaching, but at Heather's school, they just sent them the work and they had to, the, the parents had to actually be the teachers for, right. their, for, her, for her kids. That and so, yeah, yeah, that was really hard. So just gave them tips on how to survive it and not just get stressed out. If, if the kids see that you're stressed out, they'll be stressed out too. So that was the main thing. Don't stress them out and don't stress yourself out with it. Um, but as, I think I sure have, thing is important. Yeah, what Stinger Stinger was in uh, a junior in high school, so I really didn't have to, you know, do anything with him. He was tell, you know, he could do everything by himself. But just making sure that they had, you know, that they were eating on time, that they had breaks as well. Take them outside, let them get some recess, let them run around, get off some of that energy, and make sure that they were taking brain breaks as well. Yeah, I get that. And so I wonder how many parents will going into the fall. Well, I'm sure many of them were happy to send their kids back to school, but I know there are some who are still concerned about the Delta variant, and maybe they have younger children who can't get vaccinated, and so they may opt to keep their children at home, you know, even through the next school year. So I I, I guess the same thing applies, just pacing yourself, giving the kids a schedule, taking those important breaks. What um, what kinds of things do you do? We've talked already about the fact that middle school is a really interesting age <laughs> to, to have to manage. These kids are kind of going through that, not midlife crisis, but it's like that transition period yeah. coming from childhood into yes. adulthood. Between. And so, <laughs> yeah, that's who I've had two of them in my life, in my house. So I already know what that's like. But and so, it, you know, you're already dealing with all of that. In, in this with this age group and then you throw on all of the craziness of COVID. So what are some of the things that you talk about in the book? Talk a little bit about the book for teachers, but maybe even parents of these kids might be able to implement some of these things, particularly if they're teaching their kids at home to bring out the best in these students and, mm-hmm. and, and bring out the best in them in a time when, you know, w- the, the challenges are even greater than, than the normal school year would be. Yeah, so I wrote this book. I've been writing this book, Superstar Teacher, A Guide to Enhance Creativity in the Classroom. And um, I, the pan, with the pandemic, it gave me time. It gave me time to, to, to focus and to focus on what I wanted to do. And this book has been in the making for a while. So um, I always said the pandemic was good to me where I had time to write this book. And so... With this book, I'm talking about creativity in the classroom. And um, it can go for, for parents at home as well, because if you're at home and you're the homeschool mother, or the parent, or the teacher, these are ideas where you can help your student and engage them and not, you know, be so, you know, rigid and strict and everything. So I taught first grade for 10 years. And so I decided that all the things that I did in the class that was engaging for the students, I was going, I started writing them down. Anything that was fun for the kids, anything that I knew that my students would come back five years and say, Miss Helen, I remember when we did this in class. Oh, I'm still singing this song about addition and the nouns and the verbs. So I was like, hmm, I'm going to start, I'm going to write this stuff down. And so the month, the book goes from August 
to May of different things that I did in my classroom to engage my students to help make them lifelong learners. And um, it can go for homeschoolers as well. So I, I wrote the book and I, I, I took pictures and I gathered everything that I could I can remember from what I did in school and I knew that this book would also, because school was starting and we were going to be back in the classroom and because kids' minds are, you know, they're been watching TV and playing video games and everything is just like going at a million miles per hour. So I knew that even before the pandemic that I had to make sure that I was engaging my kids. So I would come to school dressed in, as Superwoman, dressed as the Statue of Liberty, dressed as anything if I wanted to get a point across that I wanted them really to remember. So the visual that they saw of me and hearing that also made it sound for them to remember and to to take it throughout life. And so uh, with the book, I think that it can help. Well, I know for sure that teachers who have lost their creativity or who are still creative but just need some new ideas, it's in the book. Parents who are looking for new ways to engage their students who are at home. I mean, you might know a parent may not want to dress up, but hey, if I saw my mother coming into the class, you know, with a Superman outfit, I'm like, okay, what is she doing today? And so that's that's going to trigger my memory to help me remember, you know, what she, you know, taught me that day. And so with my book, I um, I'm just very proud of it and just happy that I um, that I took the time and I listened to God and my husband to say, hey, look, it's time for you to finish writing this book because this has been in, uh, um, in the making for a long time. And I think that. Um, with, with creativity and engaging the students, we have to make sure that we are going 120% more than what we used to do in the classroom. Because now with technology and Zoom mm -hmm. and all of those things, we have to make sure that we're keeping their attention. Not saying that every day you have to do flips and jumping and dress up, but making sure that you are doing something that's quality and to engage your students to help them be lifelong learners. Yeah, so it's obviously it's it's obviously about thinking outside the box and mm -hmm. doing things that are unconventional. Mm -hmm. And you, what you're saying basically is that it's just a way to get their kids' attention, basically to to wake them up mm -hmm. to, to sh from their from their reverie. They're they're you know, right. staring, sort of like, oh wait, Miss Holland is dressed up as Supergirl. I think I'm going to pay attention today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any? little tricks or tips that you offer I know you don't want to give it all away which you can't anyway y'all got to go get the book but any other little tips or tricks so things like dressing up is one is there, is there something else that kind of just is a way to wake them up and get their attention yeah so I also talk about rigor in the book and so I have been doing a segment on um rigor and what what rigor is in the classroom and um I have also been on WJOU this month um, so if you in Huntsville or wherever you are, you can hear me in the mornings um, talking about giving, you know, excerpts from my book. So I am giving little little tidbits from it, but I have been talking about rigor and I have been talking about um, how rigor is, you know, I've always wanted administrators always say teach with rigor. And I'm like, what? What is rigor? Show me. Give me some examples of what it is. And yeah. so I had to research for myself what it really is. And so I found two um, educators, um, Jackie um, Blackburn and Jackie Murray, who really helped me understand what rigor was and is. And so I started implementing those things in my classroom. And I realized that rigor is not giving a whole bunch of homework, giving projects, giving work and work on top of work. It's a way that you do it to help the students to remember. And so um, it's um, what rigor is creating an environment where students are excited to learn, they're supported so they can learn, and they're cheered on as they demonstrate learning. All of this is done at high levels. And so she gave about 22, and I took 12 that I use all the time. And I'm just going to give you about three of them. So um, one of them is building grit in students, where you are letting them know that they are capable and competent. And that thinking hard really doesn't mean that they don't understand it. It's that they, it means that they want to understand. Another one is um, when you ask a question to a student, pause. We so we really want students to answer the question so, so fast. And sometimes you just need to let them ponder what the question is and think about it. 
um, before they answer, giving them wait time. So that's a form of rigor, wait time before you at when you're asking a question. Um, setting your expectations high. So if you don't set your expect um, expectations high, then your students won't follow that. So if I say, hey, we're going to do this at this level, and you're setting that up here and they're going to match it so they're mirroring what you want them to do another one is um you're going to face the unknown questions with a smile and working with little kids they say the the stuff out of the box and you just have to make sure that you're not making them feel uncomfortable when they're talking right and so you face it with the smile you smile and then you let them keep on talking never make them feel that they are that they've said something you know that was wrong or silly you know go with the flow and take it with the smile and the one more is let's see listen to their answers this is a form of rigor listen to their answers pay attention to what they're saying and make sure um, that you are challenging them to be thorough don't answer me a question with yes uh i don't know you know give me a full sentence you know make it, making sure that they are answering properly and you're listening to what they're saying so those are some of the things that i talk about in the book that are really really important with rigor uh, because i always had a problem with what what is rigor and so Using these examples helped me to make sure that I was teaching rigorous and making sure that my students were learning and becoming lifelong learners. That's the most important to me, that what I'm teaching is something that they can remember for a lifetime. That's good. So what challenges have you been faced with in the past with students that you at maybe in the moment didn't know how to handle? What, what have been some of the difficulties that you've encountered? Um, I would say some of the difficulties would be um, working with um, with with students who have special needs. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when I when I first started teaching, my first year, I had a student who had special needs, and I tried everything to help that student. But because I wasn't specifically trained in special ed, I didn't know how to help that student. I did everything I could. I loved on them. I did everything, but it, it just didn't work. And that was a challenge for me. And so with that challenge, I wanted to go back to school so I can, you know, go and see if, how I can help students in the future that would, um, that in the event, if I ever had that situation, that I will be able to handle it. So um, I would say another challenge would be, you know, just some a parent who who is just hovering over the kid and not giving the kid a chance to do their own work. And the kid is coming to school saying, I tried to do my work, but my mom did it for me because I was taking too long. So, you know, just little simple things like that. I really haven't had so many challenges. Um, and, and I thank God for that so much for in the schools that I've been in. I really haven't had, you know, so, so many challenges. But the ones that I do come across, I'm, I'm able to nip it in the bud, even if it's a conversation with a parent, just making sure that the communication um, ways are open and that there's no, you know, misconstrued words of anything. So mainly, I don't want to type anything. I want to get on the phone. Let me call you. Let me talk to you. Um, because mm -hmm. your words can get misconstrued. If you're typing, you can take it the wrong way or whatever. So I'm making sure that I communicate with my parents. And I sent an email every single day. I let them know what was going on in the classroom. So I didn't give them a chance to come at me with anything. So um, <laughs> Just being proactive, making sure that, hey, I'm thinking before you think it. Because at the time, I had Stinger in the class, and I, you know, I have a student, too. And so I knew, you know, what parents were look, was looking for, yeah. even though I was, I'm his parent. But there are things that I was looking for in a teacher as well. So when I look for those things, I made sure I did those things as a teacher because I knew parents would want those things as well. Yeah, it definitely helps when, you, when you're a mom as well as a teacher because you're able to see both sides. So when you when you talk to parents, or if, you know, if you if you were to paint a picture of the ideal parent teacher relationship, what would that look like? What is it that you wish that all every child had in, in terms of that? You know, the the support on both sides. What what helps support you as a teacher if you have a, a parent who does what with their child at home? Yes. Yeah, so for me, for, um, as a as a parent and a teacher, I would want my idea ideal situation would be just open communication mm -hmm. just making sure that um that the parents 
the parent and I are on the same page. So in the beginning of the year, I give my phone number out. I, I know that's bad, but I do because, well, this was for the little kids. Now, the middle schoolers, I have not given my number out to them because <laughs> they will be calling. But um, just making sure that the, the avenues of communication is open and that um, that you are, you know, if you have a problem, you're communicating it to me and you're not going over my head talking to my administrator or my principal, that you're talking to me about it and um, making sure that if there's a problem with me or the student, that you can talk to me about it. And I'm, I'm an open book. I'm on face. I mean, they see me all the time. I have them as my friends. And, you know, so they see the things that I'm doing every day. I'm sending an email saying, hey, this is what we did in the class, even though they're middle schoolers, because some of them don't come home, you know, with their homework. So mm -hmm. I'm in the beginning of the week. I'm giving you a whole um, what do I call it, a study guide of what the mm -hmm. things that we're doing in the week. So as a parent, I would love for you to read your emails. <laughs> <laughs> to, you know, open the emails up and see exactly, you know, what I'm doing, because before you can even ask that question, I have already answered it for you. So just communication is a really, really big key for me. And I always keep those avenues open. And so I'm known for that. I communicate and you're not going to have to worry about if your kid took a test. He's waiting three weeks for a grade. No, I'm grading as soon as you get your test, because I know that I want my answer. I want to know what I got on the test or a quiz. I want to know. So all of those things I'm, I'm making sure that um, I'm on top of my job and on top of grading and doing all those things to make sure that you don't have to call me or ask me you know what grade did my, my kid get but making sure that the communication avenues are open that's a big part of parent teacher kid communication for me yeah I hear you so you know every kid is different every kid has a different style of learning some some excel in the classroom, others struggle. How do you sort of bridge the gap when you're trying to work with a classroom full of different types of learners and students that are at various levels of preparedness? Right, so I always say, you know, Jesus was our master teacher and mm -hmm. he was the first person to, to differentiate. If you're in the Bible, you know, he had disciples. He had, those were his students and so, some of his disciples learned by, you know, him doing parables, telling parables. Some of them, he had to actually show the miracles to them. And some of them, you know, they, it's all different types of learning. So what my students, if I have 27 different students, I know for sure that all of them are going to learn differently. So sometimes in the beginning of the year, I test my kids to see where everybody is. So some of my students, you come in first grade, they may be on the second grade level. I'm going to take them where they are. I'm not going to give them first grade work. If you're in second grade, I'm giving you second grade work. So I differentiate for all of the students. So I know what levels they are on. And so sometimes I find myself giving five different sets of homework. So if I have you in a group, I know that for sure you're in a group where you can master the work that you're doing. I never, ever want any kid to feel like they don't know how to do anything. So when they go home, the homework that they're getting, five minutes or 10 minutes, your parent doesn't even have to help you. It's something that we already did. It's a refresher and you know that you can go home and do this work. So I'm not going to give you a three-tiered homework when you're when you're on one tier, you know what I mean? So um, I differentiate for my students and I make sure that each of the students have the work that they can do, that they can master so they can feel that they are smart and they are capable of doing the work that we're doing in class. Now they don't know who has what homework unless, you know, some kids, I had two kids that rode home together and one parent emailed me and she said, um, my kid didn't get the homework that this kid got. And I had to try and tell them in a, in a nice way, you know, all kids learn differently. So I gave your student the work that your student can do. And that student got another work that they could do. So, you know, sometimes parents will find out and try to compare. But I have to tell them, hey, mm -hmm. I am taking a student where they are. And so I differentiate for the students and I differentiate with those different types of groups. And I make sure that each kid is capable of doing the work that we're doing in the class. That's so good. I think that's so important because. Mm -hmm reality is they're not going to learn all the same. So you can't no. use techniques for all of them. So I, I teach a little bit as well. I'm not teaching middle school, but I do mm -hmm. a lot of small group work because I think that's really the only effective way yes. to yes. engage where they are. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So what what is, go- is what is the fall going to look like? I know you're preparing to go back next week. Now that we're coming out of COVID, you've been through this year and a half of online school. Talk to us a little bit about what's going to be new or different as we go as you go back next week. What do you have in store? What do you have in store for kids? I know all. I mean, the kids are excited about coming to, back to school. I mean, they are really excited. They haven't seen their friends in over a year and a half. And, you know, last year we did a, a hybrid um, situation where we came in two days a week, but still kids opted not to come into class. So out of 96 kids, we probably had 20 kids, 22 kids that came back from middle school um, between sixth, seventh and eighth grade. So um, I've been you know, trying to fix my room up and decorate my room and um, my principal, you know, we can't have couches and, you know, the little lounge areas and all of the wonderful, you know, cozy little reading nooks that I would have in my class. I can't have them. So I'm really sad about that. So I have to, you know, do the room in a way where, you know, it was, it can't be six feet because my biggest class has 27 kids in it. So I had to space them three feet apart and that was hard. So it took up the whole entire room. And so just planning with that, um, I was getting kind of worried because I was like, how is it going to look? I want them to come into the classroom because my classroom is always a homey type feel and they can feel comfortable. They can lounge on the couch over here. They can sit on a chair, a beanbag over there, but I couldn't have those things in the class. So what I did was I found a lot of wonderful sayings and affirmations and you're worthy, you're you're smart, you're, I'm happy for you to be here. So anywhere that they look around in my class, they will see those love affirmations and things that would help them to remember that, hey, you're special. I love you. You're here in the right place. You belong. You're the sunshine. So any place that they look around in my room, they will see those things. So I have been pre- preparing for them. And for the first couple of weeks, we're just going to get to know each other. We're going to get reacquainted. I want to know how they're feeling. You know, some of them have lost people because lost family members because of COVID. So I don't want to just jump into work. I want to get to know where they are so I can know how to teach them and how to, you know, to handle them throughout the school year. So mm-hmm. I'm excited to get back into the classroom and to see them. I can't hug them because I'm a hugger. And, you know, when my kids come in the morning, I give them a hug, I give them a fist pump. So we're going to have to find some type of way while I'm standing at the door, you know, fist pump, doing something, you know, to get them excited about coming in into class. But um, it's going to be challenging. We have to teach with a mask. They have to wear a mask. Um, so the mask, when I was in, I mean, it was, it's difficult. So yeah. It's just going to, it's just, it's, we're going back, but it's, it's not really going back. It's really going to be the new normal. So it's, it's, we have to do it. And I roll with the flow. I'm not going to complain about it. I already said going in, I'm going to have a positive mindset. I'm going to do the growth mindset, not the fixed mindset, because I teach that to my students. So I need to apply it to myself as well to make sure that I am positive about everything that I'm talking about in school with myself so that I'm making sure that I'm giving my 120% in the classroom. So I think it's going to be a good year. It's going to be a good year. I um, It's going to be different, but yeah. it's going to be a good year. And I thank God already. He's already going to bless us to make sure that it's a good year. Yeah, I believe that as well. I believe that as well. And I'm sure that you will, you're ready for whatever comes. So before we say goodbye, why don't you tell everyone about the the challenge, the book challenge? I know you have the book out. It's selling well and mm-hmm. something really special for the school that that buys the most books. Talk a little bit about that. Right. So on the day of my release, I did a live on my sister's channel, um, Karima's um, Instagram page, and she surprised me with some guests. The first one was Yolanda Adams, and she came on. She used to be a teacher, and she um, poured into me and, you know, congratulated me. And then the next person was Eric Thomas. You know, Eric, he went to Oakwood with us and um, E.T., the hip hop preacher. And so he challenged schools and administrators and teachers and principals that whichever school bought the most books that he would come and do a professional well he and I would come and do a professional development for their teachers Eric is not only a motivational speaker you know for a corporate um, world and NFL 
his passion is school. He has a doctorate in education. And so his passion is, is students and teachers. And so with this book challenge, you know, what, whatever school or county or conference that buys the most books, we will come and do a free professional development at their school. It's over on September, I mean, on August 21st, which is Saturday. And people have been buying the books and we cannot wait to see who is going to win the challenge. Um, but we're very, very excited about it and um, just want all the teachers just to get this book in their hands because um, it has some really, really good gems in it and um, ideas for teachers who have new teachers too, new teachers who have, um, who are going into education, teachers who are, um, who are in education, but just, you know, need a little more boost for this year, just a little bit more creativity. And those seasoned teachers who just, you know, who are tired, but they still want to be in it. But this book is for you. It's for a parent. If you just want to know what you could do to help your teachers in school, hey, get them this book and say, hey, here are some ideas that you could use to give to your teacher. And if you're a homeschool mother or a father, homeschool this book is for you as well you can you can boost up your homeschooling as well with this book and um i just want everybody who reads it or gets it in their hands to be blessed by it and find just one thing that they can um take from it and implement it in their classrooms well you said it earlier it's such an important work that we're doing because these children it's so cliche, I know, but they literally are the future. And maybe they're not even the future. They, they really are the present because young people are doing really incredible things even now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so important that we continue pouring into them, that we don't give up on them, that we don't give up, period, because it's too hard. But we stay the course. You know, yes, we're going through a difficult time, but, you know, we can do this if we yeah. stick together and stick with mm -hmm. it and take breaks and you know, meet them where they are. And so I think this this message that you're giving is important, as you said, not just for teachers, but even for parents, especially if they're homeschooling. So the challenge is out, guys. There's just a week left for schools and districts. If you would love for your school, your child's school to uh, be blessed by this, this uh, book and be blessed by the professional development opportunity, the information is there. We'll put it in the comments. And uh, you can find, they can find you, Ebony, where you want to give your information. So if you go on to my website, www.ebonytholland.com, you can find the information about the book challenge. There is a tab there. You can click on that. Um, there's more information. I give a video explaining exactly how you can um, get us to come to your school. But everything is on my website, ebony, www.ebonytholland.com. And if they, you know, my social medias, I'm, I'm posting there all the time as well. Um, on Instagram, I'm Ebony T. Holland. On Facebook, Ebony T. Holland. My business page is The Superstar Teacher. Um, I'm also The Superstar Teacher on TikTok. I have a TikTok now, so I've been doing <laughs> all of the you know she's cool if she has a TikTok. <laughs> and because I know that my students, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to meet them where they are, really. So I'm trying to do all the things, getting to know what they like. And this is this. I don't have a Snapchat because singers like, please don't get on Snap. So that's the one I will not get on. But the yeah. other ones, you know, I want to meet them where they are. I want to, you know, find out what they're doing so I can relate to them. And so because they have been through this pandemic, you know, I told them, look, you guys are making history. We made history. That's Your right. kids are going to read about this in the history books. And I teach social studies and history. And I'm like, look, you're a part of this. You can tell your kids, I went to school in a pandemic. Nobody yeah. else can say that. This is something that we made. We made history. And so I want to make sure that I am, you know, involved and, you know, in their, in their lives, being up in their business, find out what they're doing so I can reach them where they are. And that's the most thing, important thing to me, going back to school, not necessarily giving a whole bunch of work, but meeting them where they are and talking to them because a lot of them have been, this is trauma for them, you know, yeah. so I want to make sure that I am doing the social emotional thing with them where in the morning when they're coming, hey, we're talking about what, what what did you do yesterday? What did you do the day before that? Putting that question on the board, making them write out their thoughts because a lot of them don't talk. And so maybe writing would be the, the thing for them. So I'm looking forward to introducing all these new things that I've learned in this pandemic as well to my students this year. 
Awesome. I know it's going to be a great year and mm -hmm. I wish you all the best. And I, and I know your students are excited. So let's go back with a positive attitude and, and yes. Yay. <laughs> we can all be superstars. Yes. Everybody can be a superstar teacher, superstar moms, dads, <laughs> students, schools, everybody. But superstar teacher, get this book, www.ebonytholland.com. Last plug. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. We Thank are going to go to our scripture. Appreciate everything that you are doing, Ebony. Awesome, awesome stuff. And I think that our scripture is really appropriate for this conversation. It comes from James chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure then peace loving considerate submissive full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere i love what ebony shared with us today i love that it comes from a heart of passion for the good of the young people that she encounters every day and i think that it's so important as we consider the time that we're in and now we're looking at going back to some kind of new normal that we remember that God gives us what we need. And if we trust in him, he will give us the wisdom that we need to handle what is in front of us. So let's not lose hope. Let's be encouraged. Those of you who are teachers or parents, go out and get this book, share it. If you're a mom, share it with, or a dad, share it with your child teacher. And let's take a positive stance towards some of this negative stuff that we're facing today and always of course trusting in God to get us through. I thank you guys so much for being here today for joining this conversation. Just know that you are not alone. Whatever it is that you're going through, we're going through it together. So let's encourage one another every day. God bless you all. We're gonna have another great guest next week. I can't wait for you to meet her. You'll hear more about her. So be sure to join us. Hey, girl, every Saturday at five. I'll see you soon. Back to life or back to a new normal? If not, that's okay. We'll get through it together. Join us Saturdays in August as we work through what it means to go back. Only on Hey Girl, Saturdays at five on Facebook Live.